everyone. Good afternoon. So as um, Jean indicated, I'm a partner at a law firm and my area of expertise is labor and employment law and part of that is I do a fair amount of human rights law and I actually act primarily for employers. Um, I don't do a lot of work for individual employees but I do some pro bono work so I do some free legal advice for certain individuals in the human rights area and I've had opportunity over the last 12 years of my career to work for um, employees that have been discriminated in, again, in employment based on their disability. So I've done a little bit of a variety of work in that field. So today I wanted to focus on sort of human rights um, issues that arise in employment, both at hiring, during employment, and on termination and also talk a little bit about just how the law works in that area because I think it's important to have a bit of a knowledge base of what your rights are and what the employer's obligations to you are. So I do have, I did give a handout, it's a PowerPoint presentation so I might say on the next slide but you don't really have to look at the handout. The handout's more um, for you to take home and you can have it as a reference guide and when you read through it you might remember something I said and then if you have an issue you can you know, seek out legal advice if, if there's a serious legal issue. But today I just want to arm everyone with, with some knowledge, some general high-level knowledge of this area of the law. So first and foremost, I think it's very important for anyone with a disability, and you know, I use that term disability because it's a legal term. So under human rights law, um, <coughs> employers have a duty to their employees who have a mental or physical dis disability. It's a legal test. So if you have a disability that's recognized under the law, your employer has certain rights, certain obligations to you and you have certain rights. So I don't use that term other than in its legal sense because unless you have a disability that needs, um, you need help in the workplace, the human rights law doesn't apply. So it's very important to understand that, you know, I'm not using that term in any other sense. So it, I think, generally speaking, and I'm on sort of the first slide after the title slide, it's important to be aware of your legal rights, and it's important to sort of find your voice and advocate for yourself. So as you'll see when I give you sort of the overview of the law, the law is actually on your side. But it is true that a lot of employers, even though you know we're in a modern society, human rights laws have been around for a really long time in Canada, you still have a situation where employers don't know what they're doing when it comes to human rights issues. And I'll give you an example. I actually do a lot of work with Parkinson's patients. Um, and one of my recent clients, he had an issue where after he told his employer, who he worked for for 12 years, that he had Parkinson's, the employer all of a sudden started saying, oh, you know, I don't think it's going to work out, maybe you should find another job, it seems that you're not able to do the job that you were doing in the same way. So it turns out that he was doing the job in the same way, but the employer was very afraid of the future and how the symptoms would get worse and how he would have a problem on his hands because this very important employee would no longer be able to do the job. So he called me and he's like, what can I do? And I told him, well, what we need to do is explain to your employer what's likely to happen, what you're likely to need in the job, and we, had, we started a, a dialogue. And it was a dialogue at first between lawyers, so the company had a lawyer, but thankfully the company had what I like to believe is a good lawyer because the lawyer was not sort of creating a wall, the, law, the lawyer was trying to create a bridge. So we created a bridge of communication. And then the party sat down and they had a very frank conversation about the diagnosis, about the symptoms, and how the symptoms were affecting the job. And you know, he's been working there since that time, which was like a sort of glitch in a 12-year career. It's been over a year and I haven't heard anything because of course I said, as soon as there's another problem, call me and we'll try to we'll try to fix it. So I think it's very important that you try to create an open line of communication with your employer. And you know, it's trickier when you're trying to get hired, but when you're already in, an, in a job, it's important to have an open line of communication with your employer because often there's some fear and some lack of knowledge and you know, the most important start to any employment relationship is good communication and making sure that 
you're educating your employer so that when you do need help in your job, which, you know, legally speaking, we call that accommodation, and I'll get to what accommodation is, you have sort of the foundation laid so that you can start having those conversations and remaining a productive member of the workforce. But it is also important to be realistic. <laughs> Um, you know, the law is there to protect you and confers rights, but the law has its limits. So unfortunately, the law does not make someone hire you or make someone um, treat you properly once you're hired. The law is more about you have remedies and you can go take them to court or take them to a tribunal proceeding if they breach the law. So you're trying to avoid getting into a situation to the extent you can where you're being discriminated against. It's much better to try to have a line of communication where you're saying, okay, this is, these are sort of my needs and then I can do this job, as opposed to facing real discrimination. And unfortunately, real discrimination happens every day. <laughs> it's terrible. I'm sure a number of you have faced that in your lives already. Um, and I do have a few examples that I'll talk about later of cerebral palsy um, and people with cerebral palsy that have actually taken their employer to court, um, specifically the Human Rights Tribunal, and have been successful in getting damages from them. So there is a fight out there to try to make sure that you know human rights are vindicated and that people don't get away with discrimination, but it happens. So it's important to know that that can happen and to be kind of ready for what you might face when you're out there. So generally speaking, on the, you know, as I've mentioned, disabled employees have rights and employers owe obligations, and those rights come from the BC Human Rights Code. So the specific right I've outlined on the slide that starts Section 13, Sub 1. So Section 13, Sub 1 of the Human Rights Code states, a person must not refuse to employ or refuse to continue to employ a person or discriminate against a person regarding employment or any term or condition of employment because of the race, color, ancestry, place of origin, political belief, religion, marital status, family status, physical or mental disability, sex, sexual orientation, or age of that person, or because that person has been convicted of a criminal or summary conviction that is unrelated to the employment or intended employment of that person. So you'll see that I underline the words physical or mental disability. So that's where the rights come up for anyone suffering from a recognized disability like CP. Um, if you are discriminated against at the time of hire, during the relationship, or on termination, you have rights arising from this particular piece of law. And of course you have rights if, if it's one of the other grounds, like a breach of your right to freedom of religion. But today we're focusing of course on the issues that arise from physical disability. So as I said, there are cases that have come up where people with cerebral palsy have brought complaints to the Human Rights Tribunal, and the Human Rights Tribunal has recognized it as a disability that's protected from discrimination <coughs> under human rights laws. And what is discrimination? Well, very simply, and it's actually quite a complicated answer, but in, in its simplest form, discrimination is a policy or practice where it results in an individual being treated less favorably because of his or her disability. So if someone says, okay, these three people are equally qualified for the job, but this person has a disability, so we're not even gonna look at them for the job, discrimination, it's not okay. You have to evaluate that person um, on their qualifications and their ability to do the work, independent of the fact that they also have a disability that might require um, Special, have special requirements in the workplace. So the next slide is an important slide. It's, it's titled duty to accommodate. And the duty to accommodate is basically um, a duty that every employer has to applicants for employment, to people that are working at their company, and to build into the analysis when they're deciding to terminate someone from employment. And the duty to accommodate arises under the Human Rights Code so that section I read to you, basically an employer has a duty to accommodate anyone that has something under that section. So if you have a disability, and you know, to use an example, this test comes from a case where a female firefighter was fired after she had been a firefighter for three years. So this is the leading case from the Supreme Court of Canada. 
And in that case, in the case called Mioran, she had been a firefighter for three years, and then all of a sudden the government changed the tests for qual qualifications to be a firefighter, including you had to do, I don't remember the exact um, seconds, but you had to run a certain distance in a couple minutes or three minutes, or there was a time that, and if you didn't run in that time, you hadn't met the qualification, so, they were, so you were fired. So she was fired. So she had been a firefighter, and then all of a sudden the qualifications for being a firefighter changed, and they said, okay, sorry, you can't run in the speed you're, you need to run to be a firefighter, so you're fired. So she took it to court, to the Human Rights Tribunal, excuse me, and then she won. The Human Rights Tribunal said, yep, you've been discriminated against because you're a woman. And the test that was developed, and you know, she had to go to the Court of Appeal because the employer fought it, and then they went to the Supreme Court of Canada because the employer fought it again. And the test is that the actual barrier that you're implementing a policy can't be discriminatory. It has to be rationally connected to the purpose. So the court did an analysis at the end of the day that said, well, this arbitrary policy that says you have to run a certain amount of distance in a certain amount of time has nothing to do with whether or not this person can be a good firefighter and do the other parts of the job. So for that reason, they said that she should have been accommodated because men and women don't run the same, to use a very simple example, and there should have been a different standard that applied to her to make sure that as a female firefighter, she could be a productive member of that occupation. So the goal of accommodation is to keep you in the workforce. It's not necessarily to keep you, to keep your job or give you job security, although that seems to be one of the functions of accommodation, that if you need time off, for example, for a period of time relating to your disability because you need um, some kind of therapy or you know, some disabilities require surgery, you would have some time off and your employer would not terminate you during that period of time because the duty to accommodate would be to give you some time off. Um, but really the goal is to get you to be a productive member of the workforce. And that sometimes might mean um, having a different sort of shift schedule than some of the other employees. So for example, one of my um, clients that I've had before, his disability was that he just was really fatigued and couldn't really do his job after sort of 3 p.m. But he had so much energy when he first woke up in the morning. So instead of being sort of 9 to 5, we made a deal with the employer that he could work um, 6 to 2. So that was a kind of accommodation that we introduced into the workplace. And some of these examples are a little simple, but the easy ones always are a little simple. When it gets more complicated, that's when, unfortunately, you usually have to get lawyers and HR consultants involved. Did you have a question in the back? I thought you put your hand up. Yeah. Sure, go ahead. Well, so, I mean, it's not like, so if somebody develops a disability in the middle of the employment, do you employ them or accommodate them? if they develop some sort of disability in the middle of their employment? Yes, so the question was, just in case it didn't get picked up in the camera, um, was whether if you develop a disability sort of partway through employment, if the duty to accommodate still applies. Absolutely it does. So disability is very, very broad. It involves sort of diseases that you're born with, um, something you might be diagnosed with down the road, um, any kind of medical issue where you might not be able to do the job the way you did it before or the way someone else who doesn't have that same medical issue can do the job. So regardless of when something might occur, and you know sometimes symptoms get worse for example, well they have to accommodate that new set of circumstances. So the duty applies regardless of when you might um, have some kind of sickness issue that requires accommodation. So it's very important that we understand that accommodation is not about just getting what you want. So I have an issue sometimes when I'm acting for the employer where the employee will come and say, oh, you know, I have multiple sclerosis or I have Parkinson's disease or I have 
stress, <laughs> which is a very difficult one to accommodate actually because you need to get the diagnosis and, or I have bipolar disease or whatever it is. And, you know, they have a doctor's note and the doctor's note says, uh, I need to move to the London office for my disease. <laughs> Or I need to work, I need a bigger office, or I need a standing desk, or I need whatever it is. And sometimes you don't necessarily get the thing that you want from accommodation. So you have to keep in mind that accommodation is about what do I need and what limitations do I have in order to be able to do my job. So say my job is to someone was talking about payroll functions before. So say I'm a payroll clerk. Any doctor's note that says I need to work in London, I actually had this as a real example, that's why I'm using it, but it was for um, a stress disorder, that living in London would be just better for her stress. Um, <laughs> um, so she was hired to work in Vancouver. So that's still an employment contract, and that's a valid contract where the employer and the employee have made a deal. And the deal is, you will work in Vancouver and you will do this position. The, the job and the law is not such that you can have any job you want or you can get promoted or you can say, well, I have a disability so I should get to live in a different city. No, the job is, what do we need to do to make sure that I can do the job I was hired to do? So we rejected that request for accommodation. We said, that's not, that's not what accommodation is. If you're saying that your stress disorder is making it difficult for you to do you know, some of your duties or you need to do reduced duties for a period of time because you need more time off for doctor's appointments or you need something like that, we need to find a practical solution. So sometimes accommodation is not about the thing you want, it's about the thing that the employer can do for you to make you a productive member of, of the workforce. Excuse me. Yes? Just as a hypothetical, if there was a London office and this individual needed treatment that was solely available in London, would that change the scenario? Um, so so my client had a London office. <laughs> um, I would say that it doesn't actually necessarily change the scenario because if someone needed treatment in a different city, you would be like, take the time off. You know, we have a sick leave policy or we have... Um, a long-term disability policy that maybe you can access. Um, but yeah, that would be something that the employer could consider as, is it feasible to have this person that we expect to be here with this team working remotely while they're getting treatment? And if the answer is it's doable, the employer can do it, then it might actually be lawful that they have to do it under this test. But in, in, the mo in, in most cases, the accommodation is more small scale than large scale. So accommodation is actually a very lengthy process for an employer. They have a lot of obligations to accommodate. And in fact, they have to accommodate to the point of undue hardship. So undue hardship is a very high threshold to meet. And it usually means that an employer needs to provide accommodations for maybe a few years, and try a number of different things. So we have a lot of case law that people that have been employed by an organization have rights to say, okay, this isn't working, or it's flared up again, or whatever it is, and there's no sort of checklist that an employer can check and then say, well, you know, we've done everything we can, it's now impossible to do any more, so we're terminating your employment. So you have a fair amount of protection while you're in the workforce. Now I will say that the protection that you have while you're in the workforce is not meant to protect you from being a bad employee. <laughs> it's meant to protect you from being discriminated against or being treated in an adverse way in your employment because you have cerebral palsy. But other things that are just poor performance, say you're not doing a good job that's well within your job and well within the duties you're supposed to be doing and you're capable of doing them and you've had accommodation and everything is as it should be under the law, if you're just not performing well, your employer still has the right to discipline you in employment, maybe not give you a bonus, maybe not give you a raise, or potentially terminate your employment. 
So it's very important to realize that the sort of standards that apply to your job still apply to you. And accommodation is more about if you're falling below a certain level of performance or you need something in order to be at the level expected, then the employer needs to help work that through with you. As opposed to if everything is as it should be under the law and you're still falling below the standard of performance, that doesn't sort of make you immune to potential termination from your employment. Do you have another question? Or it's okay, I'm just bothering you. Okay, great. So, I have a question. Sure. Um, I was in a situation being an employer where an employee took a position and she had only worked for me for like two weeks and I noticed that there was a problem. So I brought it up to her, or um, I brought it up to her and then she she had mentioned to me that one of the shifts she had taken, even though she had agreed to take it, um, wasn't like she thought she, there, there, she was feeling like there could be a problem. So I was proactive and I took, I took away that shift from her to see if that was a just, like to see if that was a just the issues that we were having. Did I? I, I felt like I did the right thing just because I wanted to. I was a, accommodating what she could see as a problem or I felt like I was accommodating what she could see as a problem by adjusting her schedule and, and, and trying to move her around a little bit to, to alleviate that, um, to alleviate that from being a bigger, bigger issue. Yeah. So did she have any kind of issue under the law, like any of those grounds that I talked about? Mental disability, physical disability? No, it was just, I just wanted to make sure, I, I'm, I'm just asking from, like not, she didn't have any of those grounds from a legal standpoint, yeah. but I just wanted to just double check with you in the sense of accommodation, like for an employer to, if, we foresee a problem mm -hmm. potentially, and we've talked about it with the like the employee. Maybe I'm not coming up. No, I think that really. I think it makes a lot of sense, and I would say that you did the, you did a good thing. You were not legally obligated to do that thing, so that's the difference there. So, good employers that want to have make sure that all their employees are productive members of the workforce and give them a chance, if a problem sort of comes up. For example, you know, Friday afternoon's terrible because my kids get off at three, I can't work past three on Friday. So that would be the type of sort of simple, okay, accommodation, I'm not gonna expect you to work past three on Friday. Legally speaking, if the issue that that particular employee of yours had, provided there's no human rights issue, mm -hmm. if that didn't work for you as the employer, you can be like, you know what, this doesn't work for me as the employer, and you could have terminated her. With proper notice and whatever is in sort of your understanding as the employer. But the, the right thing to do and the, and the good thing to do is to say, okay, if, if we have this issue, let's deal with it. So you dealt with the issue. Lawfully, an employer only has to deal with an employee's preference if it's sort of under the human rights but rubric. What can I do if, I mean, maybe this isn't, maybe you know, maybe you don't know, what can I do if the, I mean, this employee, this employee is gone now, mm -hmm. but what, what can I do if the employee had already agreed to taking that shift? So did I, did I still do things appropriately? Like she agreed to taking that shift and within two weeks there was already an issue with her taking that, yeah. that one shift. Well, I mean, I think it's always good to give someone a chance. So you did do the right thing, but you, didn't, you were not legally obligated to, to accommodate that request. So accommodation is a legal standard that applies only in situations where the person seeking accommodation um, can do so because there's a human rights ground that's protected. So if she just was not capable of making that shift work for some personal reason that was unrelated to human rights laws, you didn't owe her anything. Okay, so then, so then here's the complicated part. I adjusted her schedule to see if that would work. 
And then just before I let her go, she demanded her, her hours back. And then you let even, her go? Even though it wasn't the same one. And then I let her go. Because, like, it's a kind of sticky situation, though. You know? It is. It's difficult. And that's, the, that's sort of the employer's perspective of, you know, I, I tried to help with this issue, but it didn't work out, so it's not working out. Yeah. Now, if with that situation, it wasn't working out, you let her go. You now have someone else, right? Yeah. In a situation where um, it's a human rights issue, you probably couldn't have let her go. You would have had to say, okay, well, you say you want your hours back, but say it's a medical issue. But I have no proof that you can do this these hours, so I need a doctor's note, or I need to talk to your treating physician. You go down a path of accommodation where you're trying to have a dialogue about what can happen versus what can't happen and try to reach an understanding. But again, her preference, if there wasn't a, a human rights issue, her preference to have her hours back doesn't end the dialogue because if she can't actually do that job because of a human rights issue, yeah. the employer is well within their rights to say, no, you don't get your hours back. I want a doctor's note. <laughs> I want to understand the whether or not you can do these duties. I want to understand if you can't, how we can sort of repackage your duties to make sure that you can do them. And that's how you have that dialogue of accommodation. Now, if you have the whole dialogue, and then you realize, okay, well, we've tried everything, there's nothing more I can do, then you have to consider, well, have I reached the point of undue hardship where I can now terminate this person that has needed accommodation for a period of time? That's very hard, and I would say that if you have a situation where you're the employee that's being accommodated and you're afraid that, okay, my employer is getting fed up, I might get terminated, I don't know what's going to happen, trying to find some legal advice to talk it through because there might be something you can do to prevent that from happening. But it is very, very difficult. Um, so just so we understand, though, I gave the example of the firefighter who was allowed to continue being a firefighter even though she couldn't run as fast as the men, basically. Um, there, is a, there is a test under our human rights laws that say that if the standards discriminate, discriminatory, but it's what we call a bona fide occupational requirement, so it's an actual requirement of the job, then it's not discrimination and you don't have remedies under human rights laws. So what does that mean? So for example, if a job requires you to be able to drive, very simple example of course, but you can't drive, then it's okay that that policy has that standard, even though the reason you can't drive is tied to a disability. So it's very technical, but this goes to a sort of issue of, all right, what kind of jobs am I applying for? Am I qualified for these positions? And if there's an obstacle in a policy or a practice or a qualification that is a bit arbitrary, then it's not a bona fide occupational requirement. But if it actually goes to the root of what the job is, then it is a bona fide occupational requirement and an employer is okay to say, I'm sorry, but even though it feels like it's discrimination, it's not, I don't have to hire you. N again, very technical, so the employer better get it right or else they're gonna get sued. <laughs> Uh, but there is a sort of exemption to discriminatory practices, which is that if it's directly related to the employment, it's allowed to be discriminatory. So to use the firefighter example again, there are a number of standards where <coughs> firefighters need to be able to lift a certain amount of weight. You know, lift a person, lift the hose, those types of things. That would be considered bona fide, and therefore she could have been fired if she couldn't reach those qualifications. Yes, question. Okay, um, what we'd be looking for here is to hire caregivers. Mm -hmm. um, if there is a task that, um, to my mind, helps determine whether the person can really handle the job that they're being given, and it is a task that they're going to need to perform um, once they're hired, do I have the, the right to request the person to perform that task as part of the job interview process? So, typically you have to pay someone during training or okay. probation, or even if it's pre-hire testing, okay. you would maybe 
need to consider whether or not you would pay them for that period of time if it's like okay. a longer period of time. There is a case where um, a Parkinson's patient, coincidentally, um, needed accommodation in a typing test. One of the requirements of the job was typing and the actual employer required the person to do the test. Um, so yes, you can say, well, this is a task that I need to make sure that you can do if I'm gonna hire you. But if they have a disability or some other ground that they can legitimately say, well, I wanna do that test, but this is my issue with being able to complete that test. But if you modify the test in this way, I can do it. Then under law, if it's a human rights issue, you have to accommodate. Okay. So even in testing, <laughs> to make sure that you can reach certain qualifications, you have to be prepared to accommodate. Okay. But if it's literally prove to me you have a driver's license or prove to me that you can um, cook or whatever it is, I think you can imp implement that test. And I'm not sure if you have to pay that person for their time. Okay. But often during training periods, the time is paid under employment standards. Okay. So we talked a little bit about duty to accommodate and bona fide occupational requirement. Um, let's talk a little bit about disclosure. So generally speaking, you don't actually, as a matter of law, need to disclose a diagnosis to a prospective employer. So to use your caregiver example, unless they actually want accommodation, they don't have to tell you, you know, I have bipolar disease or I have Parkinson's or I have multiple sclerosis. They don't have to tell you. Unless they actually need something in order to be able to apply for and maintain that job, they don't have to tell you. Um, in some cases, they don't have to tell you if what their actual condition is. They could just say, I have a condition that makes it difficult for me to stay awake after 2 p.m. <laughs> like that's something that they can do partial disclosure and say I need accommodation around this time frame during every day. And that's something that you'd have to wrestle with if you're the employer. As an employee, it's, it's good to be able to say, okay, well I don't have to tell them unless I need something from them. But in reality, if, you're, you know, if your symptoms are visible, it's hard not to disclose to your employer or a, a person that's interviewing you for a job your needs, right? Because they can see that you have needs. <laughs> so it's a little tricky situation. So even though the law protects you from having to disclose your diagnosis, the law is unfortunately limited in the sense that it's, it's not equipped to handle when, when it's obvious that you need accommodation. So, but in some ways that's good because employers need to kind of be on notice. Like, look, <laughs> I have cerebral palsy. This is what I need, one, two, three or one, two, three, four, five, whatever it is. Let's have a discussion. And you know they know, as soon as those words have occurred, that they have a legal duty to treat you properly. So that's important to keep in mind, although unlike other um, disabilities, many people that have CP will not have the luxury of being able to keep it, keep it a secret. Although others that wouldn't have advanced symptoms for many years could, in fact, not disclose anything and just do their job and then when at some moment there's I need accommodation because I've had this complication or this bad symptom then the employer will have a duty to accommodate you at that time. Now it's important that employers can't be like blind <laughs> they can't be blind to what's happening around them so if someone with a disability were to say nothing about their needs and not need accommodation but now their job is dipping and they're struggling and you can see that they're struggling. And you've heard rumors or you, as an employer, are like, oh, something must be wrong there. You have a duty to say, is anything wrong? What's going on? Your performance has slipped. So it's not that the employer can have blinders on and unless you say, I need accommodation, they're off the hook. But it's important to keep in mind that if you really need something from an employer or from an interviewer, you should tell them because if you don't, then chances are there's going to be some kind of discrimination against you and then you'll be in sort of a legal battle. Does the right to disclose go the other way as well? Like, does the employer have the right to ask the employee to disclose certain things? Because I've had a situation. 
situation, and Stacy yet again is gone, um, where I ask them if they've had any legal issues, um, just because something, something triggers me into, because I was doing like a background check and stuff, and they said to me no. I hired them to give them a trial, and then a week later, um, I get a phone call from courts going, we're looking for so-and-so. And I'm like, um, why, like I, wanted, like I wanted to ask her, why didn't you tell me, why didn't you disclose to me that you were going through some legal issues when I asked you? If, like, so. So the protection still applies to someone that has legal issues, but you might remember that when I read out the words of Section 13, it says that you have to be accommodated for criminal convictions unrelated to your employment. So if she's having, or this person is having, legal issues or some other kind of trouble in her life that is unrelated to the job, she doesn't have to tell you. If it's related to the job, and that's why maybe in some circumstances, you know, if this person is in your home, or um, it's hard for me to give you an exact test, but it's something you can look into about whether it's appropriate to do a criminal a criminal check. So in some jobs, so for example, one that's established under our case law is working with children. So everyone in the school board, every teacher, has a criminal background check. And if they have certain types of convictions, which would be related to assault on children, they do not get hired. So there might be a way to have your employee do a, do back, agree to do background checks and you could get checks, but you're never gonna be able to get full information from the employee, because they'll say it's private, I don't have to tell you, I'm qualified to do this job. But if you have a bad feeling, just don't hire them. Yeah. Although, that's Although, tricky because like, how do you know? Sometimes you don't know until they're already there. I know. It's always complicated, <laughs> these issues, unfortunately. So what happens if you are employed in an organization and the accommodation has failed or you've been discriminated against? Like, what are the legal rights? What could happen? And I know that today you had a talk about sort of the caregiver side of the equation, hiring someone. I am talking more about if you're the employee. So. There's different things that people have rights to do. They have a right to bring a human rights complaint. So if you feel you've been discriminated under the law, there is the BC Human Rights Tribunal and you can bring a complaint. And you can bring a complaint not only based on something arising from employment, but there's also provisions that allow you to bring a complaint if you've been discriminated against in services. And what does services mean? You know, rental services, when you're trying to rent an apartment, or if you're going into a restaurant and you're treated poorly, those services issues don't happen as often as employment issues. Um, you can bring a civil proceeding. So if you're terminated unlawfully, you can claim severance in the courts. Or if you've been bullied and harassed, you can bring a workers' compensation complaint. So I'm not gonna really dive into it, but you should keep in mind that if you feel that you've been discriminated against, you have rights that you can do some research and look into them and try to find some legal advice. There's clinics that help um, in the human rights field that are very good, and that's always useful. <coughs> if you feel that something's, something terrible has happened to me and I, I don't wanna let it go. And you shouldn't have to let it go. And there are people that have suffered, that are CP sufferers that haven't let it go. So I wanna, on my last two slides, and then I'll just take some general questions, there's, um, a number of cases that cerebral palsy sufferers have brought human rights complaints because they were discriminated against in employment. And unfortunately, the facts are very terrible. It's horrible that this happened to them. Um, but they fought the good fight and they did get monetary awards from the tribunals. So in the first example is a case from the BC court, the BC tribunal in 2012. And there, the complainant in that proceeding had applied for just summer work and at an inn. And he had previous experience. His, his winter job was um, sort of janitorial services. 
and he applied for summer work at an inn doing room attendant work. So all very the same job, basically. Like he had the qualifications, he was able to do the work, um, he had references, everything. So the evidence was that he was interviewed on the phone. And during the phone interview, he admitted that he works with a cane, that he walks around with a cane and he works, he works with his cane. So not knowing that this person had cerebral palsy, but knowing that he needs accommodation, i.e. unlike every other room attendant, he needs to work with a cane, the HR person that interviewed him was not wanting to give him a second interview. He's like, oh, you know, it's too much hassle, it's too much trouble, I don't know. Talk to his manager, and the manager said, no, if he says he can do the job, why don't you bring him in for an in-person interview and ask him about the duties, and if he can do the job, we should hire him. <laughs> so instead of doing what her manager said, she decided to, well, she says her evidence was, but the tribunal did not believe her, her evidence was that, um, oh, I called his house number and he never answered, so, and then I forgot, and we didn't set up the second interview. Even though on his cover letter, it clearly stated, his cell number, and please reach me at my cell number. So she just was not, she was not, she didn't want to deal with it. And you know, that's a breach of human rights laws. You have to deal with it. So they went to um, the tribunal proceeding, and they found that the employer had breached the law by not following through with their duties to make sure that you know he was treated fairly and not discriminated against. And they awarded that person $1,700 in the lost wages, which was about what he would have made in the summer. And then $5,000 for something called injury to dignity. And that's a human rights type of damages where if you're discriminated against, the tribunal will award you a sum. And just a sentence that the tribunal adjudicator said about this individual. So he testified that he suffers from cerebral palsy he said the disability affects his mobility, his hand-eye coordination, and his fine motor skills. This was observable during the course of the hearing. Also observable was his competence presenting his case. So in the decision, the tribunal member said a number of complimentary things about this individual who had brought his claim forward. And I just circle back to my opening comments, which are, you know, you advocate for yourself. The law is on your side, and, and you're, you're, you have an ability to advocate for yourself if, if you're looking for employment and, and want to get into the workforce, or you have a job and you feel you're being mistreated. Advocate for yourself, and if you have to go down this path of adjudication, there's people out there that will be on your side. Uh, yeah. Do you have knowledge of how the complainant discovered that this was the cause that he didn't get the job? He had a bad feeling. And thankfully in human rights law, if you have a bad feeling and you bring a complaint and you can show that there's prima facie discrimination, which refers to you know, some basic facts that show that there is discrimination. So the fact that he admitted that he needed to use a cane and then they never called back even though when they first talked, you know, oh yeah, we really need a room attendant, you have great experience. This totally like, like, like his facts about, oh, I feel that this is because I said I needed accommodation, um, was enough then to shift the burden to the organization to have to prove that they didn't discriminate against him. So the law is favorable in the sense that if you can establish that you know, there's facts here that suggest discrimination, then the employer kind of has to prove it. And once you're down that, once to, has to prove that they did nothing wrong, basically. So once you're down that path and in a proceeding, the employer also has to disclose documents. And this HR manager had actually written on, I forget the exact language, but she had written on his cover letter, um, uses a crutch, like on his cover letter. So that showed that she was using considerations that are not relevant to whether or not he could do the job in evaluating whether or not to give him a second interview. So the process is, just to be clear here, mm -hmm. so under, with the Human Rights yeah. Tribunal, once there's a prima facie case, then the burden? Then the burden shifts, shift. yes. So okay. the prima facie case would be established by, you fill out a form, it's on the internet, it's called a complaint form, actually, and you fill out the complaint form and, you, and, it, and it walks you through step by step and it says, 
you know, what are the facts that you believe are a breach of the human rights code or discrimination under human rights code. So he would have written all his facts. And then the human rights tribunal would send that to the employer and give them an opportunity to respond. And then you would have a situation where the tribunal process would take over and the parties have to disclose documents and have to make submissions and have to appear for a hearing. And a lot of people handle these matters on their own. He represented himself in this particular proceeding. So human rights is not necessarily a place where you need a lawyer, but it is very hard to do it yourself. So I don't want to sugarcoat that. But the tribunal members are very, very helpful. They've got good staff that try to help people through the process, but it's not an easy process. Nothing that involves any kind of litigation is ever um, without its stress and without its problems. So then the second case, which is really terrible facts, because it just appalls me that this happened, but this is a case from Ontario where, again, a phone interview, and during the phone interview, um, because the applicant had you know, some difficulties with his speech, the controller that was interviewing him hung up on him during the call. <laughs> it's so bad. And you know, he brought a human rights complaint because he called the controller back, and when the controller recognized his voice, he hung up again. Well, that is blatant discrimination. And the tribunal agreed in that case, and because the applicant had already found a new job, he didn't get any lost wages, but he did get $8,000 for injury to dignity, and an order from the tribunal that the employer has to go and get training about human rights. So that's good, like that helps subsequent people, right? Because I think after you have to pay some money and after you um, are ordered to take training, you're probably going to be a little bit more careful about how you treat people and treat them with some dignity. So those are kind of the things I wanted to go over. My last slide is sort of tips I give employers. So I always tell them you should be a good employer. You should try with your employees at the beginning and you should say, yeah, let's work this out, let's make this work, let's find a way to make you a success here. Follow the law. I did have an HR manager call me a couple years ago now, and she said, oh, you know, Eleni, I, I, we were about to hire this person, but I was creeping on this person's Facebook, <laughs> which has its own privacy issues that we don't have time for today, but, and, and, I, and I noticed that people are consoling her because she has a mess. Do I still have to hire her? I was like, yes, you still have to hire her. And you have to hire her, and you know about this now, so you have to make sure that you don't discriminate against her in her employment. Um, because she admitted to me that she was the most qualified applicant. So, as far as I know, they have this person working at their company, and everything's fine. But these are the things, like the knee-jerk reaction of people is to do the wrong thing. And I try to explain to people that they need to do the right thing. But again, that goes back to what we talked about at the beginning. So the MS employee, maybe she doesn't have symptoms for many years, or maybe she starts to have symptoms right away. When she needs something from her employer, time off to go to a doctor, a standing desk because it's bad for her joints or something, or some kind of special chair or some kind of accommodation, she needs to have that dialogue and connect with the employer and try to sort of work things out. So it doesn't end just because you got the job, you're, you know, you still have to be part of the process and make sure you're doing what you can to be a success in the job. <coughs> but I do think that employers are getting better. Um, they've learned a lot over the last 10, 20 years. Um, but you know, the fight's not over and it, it's a two-way street. The employers and the employees need to find a way to work together to make this work. So with that, I'll just open it up to some questions and I'm happy to answer questions. I guess we've taken them throughout. I'd like to thank you very much. It was very helpful.